This week NASA is celebrating, commemorating the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11, the first lunar landing. And as part of that celebration, today we are delighted to be here at the museum to re preview the initial results of an exciting restoration project that NASA has initiated of the Apollo 11 broadcast. To set the stage, we want to take you back to that evening of July 20th, 1969, and the broadcast coverage of this extraordinary event as it was unfolding live on a world stage. At 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. We have a liftoff, liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn for you. We're pretty good. We're going to Armstrong is on the moon, yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. Providing television from the lunar surface to the world was its own daunting technological challenge. We have here this morning two of the men who are responsible for ensuring that as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made those historic first footprints on the moon to an estimated worldwide audience of half a billion people, that people would be able to watch it live as it happened. Dick Nafsker, who's at the center, is still an engineer at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, but on that day in 1969, he oversaw television processing at the ground tracking sites during the Apollo 11 mission. To Dick's right is Stan Labar. Stan was the project leader of the Westinghouse team that built the lunar camera. And to Dick's left is Mike Inchelik, who is the chief operating officer of Lowry Digital that is working with NASA to restore these historic broadcasts. I know everybody is anxious to actually see the restored video, so I'm going to turn it over to Dick. Thank you, Mark. Um, as Mark said, my name is Dick Nafsker. Uh, I am an engineer with NASA. I was hired in 1968 uh, to come to Goddard and handle all the ground processing of television during the Apollo missions. I was 28 years old, and when I found out what TV was from the moon, it was nothing like any of us had ever watched. In 1969, I'm sure many of you were small children or even not born. Uh, we were just in the infant, infant uh, development of color TV, and what I came across was uh, I was going to be participating in a program uh, to televise from the moon, from Earth orbit, a camera that was developed by Mr. Stan Labar on my right and his company Westinghouse uh, to transmit this uh, non-broadcast TV to the ground. It was called Slow Scan. Uh, I remember on the night of the mission, uh, I was at Houston Man Space Flight Center. I was 28 years old in charge of handling the downlink, converting it so it could be transmitted in broadcast television standards around the world. 
I was not overly scared, but I know once we landed, the mission, as you know, the, the goal was to land and come back safely. It was not television. Television was something we hoped for, something that was not required, uh, but something we certainly desired. When they did land and everybody let out a sigh of relief, I recall a couple minutes later, people turning to me and saying, you know, I hope this works. They're going to turn the camera on. There's probably 600 or so million people waiting to see this first step on the moon. That's when I really understood what I was there for. And uh, to be honest with you, that was frightening for a 28-year-old engineer. It was not looking at history. It was looking at the job to be done. Uh, the Australian uh, support we had, the U.S. support, everything had to go perfect for a live transmission from the moon to come down, be converted, be fed all the way to the U.S. and to Houston and sent back out. Anyone could have pulled the plug by mistake and we wouldn't have seen it. So uh, we're very happy that we were able to present any television, uh, whether it is uh, snowy or ghosty, it was a historic event. I. Um, I've been asked today to come here and brief you on two things. Um, one is the search for these original slow scan uh, tapes. The other is a restoration project that we're working on. I'd like to explain briefly uh, to you, if you'll put up the first graphic of how TV got from the moon. Uh, this is a graphic showing that on the moon we had Mr. Labar and Westinghouse slow scan camera that downlinked to three locations, Parks Radio Astronomy in Australia, Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station, which was a manned flight station, and to Goldstone in the Mojave Desert. The slow scan from Parks was remoted to Sydney, Honeysuckle converted video to broadcast to Sydney, and the best video they had was transmitted via Intelsat. Uh, and if you go to the second slide, you'll see that the video came down into California, Goldstone, and the Intelsat site in California relayed this uh, by landline and microwave directly to Houston, where it was released uh, to the world. Um, this video, uh, originally before conversion for uh, formats that could be viewed by the world, was called Slow Scan, was recorded on 14 track tapes, and was considered uh, just a track of telemetry. Also, there has been some questions about the Slow Scan search and what we're looking for. We're looking for the original Slow Scan video, which we all know has a higher quality than the converted by the nature of the state of the art in that year, 1969. We are not looking for video that hasn't been seen. There was no video that came down slow scan that was not converted live, fed live to Houston and fed live to the world. So just in case anyone thinks there's video out there missing that hasn't been seen, that is not the case. Our goal is to try to restore and provide historically the best quality we can for future generations, for anyone that wants to see uh, this um, outstanding achievement of mankind to go to the moon the first time and actually walk on the moon. As <clears throat> was mentioned by Mark before, Stan Labar uh, on my right was a program manager. I knew him by name. I hadn't met him, but I certainly was supporting him during these missions. He built the camera that was going to go to the moon and have to sustain temperature variations of plus and minus 250 degrees. He built the camera. I converted the video and fed it to Houston. Um, Stan is also a member of the search team. I asked him to join, and he is a key member of my search team. But I'd like to turn over to Stan to make some comments about a camera that has been brought here today to, to view. Stan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the camera you see in front of you is, uh, is actually an Apollo Luna camera, and that's what they referred, referred to at the time. That camera is a flight model identical to the camera that was used by Armstrong on Apollo 11 when he planted on the moon. Uh, at the time, we took uh, three flight models uh, such as that to do a qualification test that took about six months of probably the most severe environmental test that any camera had ever been uh, uh, subjected to. These are, this is a, is an arc, not only an archival camera, but it's a pretty rare camera. There are only a couple of these cameras in the, in the, in the world that have, at least uh, to my knowledge, that are being shown. So it's a rare treat to have that with us today. Let me uh, give you just a little bit of, I'm not going to go into any technical explanation about the design or whatever, but there were two, 
two real critical parameters that we faced. Uh, one uh, was weight and the other was power. And uh, we worked, uh, we used integrated circuits to, which were in their infancy at the time to actually reduce the weight and reduce the power. The weight was seven pounds and the power was totally seven watts, which is the power that one Christmas light bulb would take. And, and that, I might add, was a phenomenal achievement at that time. Um, there was no backup. The camera had to work. Whatever camera, the camera that was on the moon, and that's the thing that we, we, we were looking to, and we were pretty confident it would do the job. I've been asked for many years what I thought about when, when I first saw the camera. Uh, let me explain that uh, I was in a little office or little lab just off the theater of mission control and we had only a monitor and a, and a scope and a telephone that we could call to, uh, to the comm people. Uh, when, um, when Aldrin uh, announced that he threw the, uh, the power to the camera, uh, I happened to look over at the, at the scope and I saw this wiggling. Uh, I said, my gosh, somebody's got a, a sync, sync pulse. And every camera has a sync pulse. And one of the, my counterparts at NASA said, that's our camera. And by gosh, he was right. Now, I can tell you before that, uh, the time before that even happened, uh, it was probably the most tense time in my life. Uh, as the clock ticked towards this thing, of, of, of when the camera was going to show, uh, I started to go through my mind of all the things we could have done, should have done, would have done. But uh, time was against us. We certainly couldn't do anything. And I, I realized that uh, this moment in time was historical and uh, that I would remember it uh, uh, for my lifetime, and I have. Uh, when, when Armstrong came out on the porch, he pulled a D-ring which opened a, a, a door, a large door, that had the camera mounted on it. So when the door swung out, the camera was positioned so it saw the, uh, the ladder and that's how that image was taken. There was a, a, a great deal of concern, although we were, were totally elated, the, the, the camera worked, but what we saw at that point was rather disturbing uh, because it was not what we had simulated and we knew we had a problem. And uh, that would uh, concern me for some 40 years. So that's what I experienced at that point in time, and that's what I remember. So let me turn it back to Dick. Who Thanks, can Stan. Carry forward. Um, in, in following up with what Stan said, this was a one-time event, as you all know. Uh, I support shuttle now. I support external tank television now at Goddard. Uh, when we launch, we don't get to do a remake, what, what producers and TV stations might do on a video tape show. So we get one shot at this. The uh, history is made one time. Uh, the reason I mention this is that the, the tapes we use to record the downlink, and I'll show you this tape, and I'll be glad, glad to show it to you in, later in question and answer. I am going to go briefly so we have time to show you the videos and have some questions and answers. But this tape, which is a telemetry tape, had one track on it, uh, that was for video, slow scan. They had 14 tracks of data, such as voice, telemetry, biomedical data. This was all treated as telemetry. Why did we record video there? For backup. In case live didn't go, we had something to play back from the original source. We also recorded the converted, so we could play from Sydney or anywhere else back to the world. Uh, but the requirement was live TV. As you know, uh, live TV was successful. The converter did degrade to some extent. The state of the art of trying to get slow scan converted to a broadcast signal that everyone could see 
has a degradation in it, and it had to be. Uh, it took a lot of setup, a lot of even art to set these up correctly. Let me tell you after the mission, these tapes, over several hundred thousand of these tapes went into Goddard and went into WNRC, the National uh, Record Center, a part of NARA, National Archives, at Suetland. These tapes, uh, we uh, were contacted by Australia, uh, and in 2004, a tape was sent to me that someone had found that thought that they had Apollo 11 on that and had kept it for 40 years or 36 years. To make the story short, um, that tape we were able to play in a p place called the Data Evaluation Lab at Goddard, which has maintained Apollo era recorders all this time to this day. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that tape could be played, the data pulled off, it did not have Apollo 11 data, but it did demonstrate that if we found the tapes, we would be able to use them. At that time, I informally started working with Australian people on an informal search for these tapes, the approximate 45 tapes. These tapes were recorded at, a, at 120 inches a second to be able to record this slow scan TV. In 15 minutes, 9,000 foot of tape was used up during each 15 minutes of that lunar television walk. So there were 45 tapes approximately that were shipped to, to Goddard and to the WNRC in amongst about four to 500,000 during the Apollo program. That's what we were looking for in one track on each of those tapes. In 2006, Goddard entered into a formal search. Uh, I formed a team with Mr. Labar, uh, Mr. John Serkissian of Australia, Mr. Colin McKellar, and Mr. Bill Wood of Mojave, uh, of the Goldstone Tracking Site. Uh, Bill Wood, myself, and Stan participate in the program. So we had knowledge of how the program worked, what the operational procedures were, and what to expect and where to go. The records were scanned. The records at Goddard went back 40 years. Some records were handmade. There weren't computers in those days to uh, put on data files everything that occurred. But it was clear that we had shipped many, many thousands of tapes to the NRC. We went to the WNRC multiple visits. Uh, this tape was found left there. What we found in the records, and it'll be detailed in a report that's issued, that uh, in 1970 to 74, we pulled out 40,000 boxes of tapes of this size. Five tapes to a box, that's 200,000 of these tapes. That was to support ongoing Apollo missions, to, to support Apollo Soyuz, to support Skylab. Uh, they were needed in the network. Uh, they were telemetry data. The data when it came back, on these tapes was there for anyone that needed it. When the program, and you withdrew these from the WNRC, if the program said we no longer need this data, the procedures as set by NARA and NASA were that you could reuse these tapes. So they were preserved for a period of time until the program who was the owner of, these, of this data was clearly uh, able to tell you that it was no longer needed. That was the plan from day one and that was what was done. In 1981-82, we pulled another 30,000. We then had uh, Landsat in dire need of tapes in the network, and we had the start of the shuttle program. Those tapes were pulled in, and uh, records show that uh, they were pull pulled out, I'm sorry, uh, and they were never returned. Uh, the records clearly showed that uh, there's an inescapable conclusion that this team has, has reached, and that is that these 45 tapes were included in the several hundred thousand that were pulled out, recertified, degaussed, and put back into the network. Uh, the slow scan recordings are no longer, and they were used in the network as part of the telemetry uh, data extraction and the uh, fact that, that that data went live and on tape and was no longer needed. During this search where we were looking for tapes, um, the team of people that I worked with, including myself obviously, was desperate to do something for history if we could. We came across broadcast converted tapes during this search that were much better than we had seen. We acquired what we consider the best available broadcast. We had tapes from recorded in Sydney, Australia during the mission. Um, Mr. Labar and I found uh, kinescopes at uh, the National Archives that had not been viewed in 36 years that were made in Houston. Uh, we went to CBS archives and we found tapes that were fed directly from Houston to CBS, the raw data, not the ones with Walter Cronkite on it, but the raw data as recorded in archive. These were the best available we could come up with at the time, but they were excellent compared to many versions. I'm sure there's other versions that may be around, but we immediately contacted Lowry Digital Corporation. Lowry Digital is a uh, company that uh, we were uh, familiar with from past support of NASA in the Apollo days. 
we told them what we were trying to do and what we would like to do, and they graciously said, if you can digitize this data from these sources, uh, we will take a look and see what's possible. Uh, we then went to NASA headquarters and got the go-ahead to take a look at this, and we digitized the tapes from Sydney, we digitized the tapes from uh, the kinescopes from National Archives, and we digitized the CBS uh, Archives tapes. Uh, these digital hard drives were then sent to Larry Digital and Michael Inchelak, the Chief Operating Officer, took a look and provided us, uh, again, graciously at no cost, demonstrations of what might be done. Um, headquarters uh, met with us, we gave presentations, and uh, we were given the go-ahead to get a contract to do the complete uh, uh, restoration of what we had for the complete EVA on television. Um, I would say also and make a point of the fact that today being the 40th, or today this week being the 40th anniversary, we're releasing what we consider many scenes that we took from the EVA, scenes being just a portion, uh, probably 40% towards our goal. We did not enter into the contract with Lowry Digital until the end of June, 1st of July. We've only been three to four weeks officially under contract, uh, but we wanted to share with you what we feel we're headed for with the September delivery. 40% uh, of, of where we're hoping to be uh, is what is on many of these scenes. Um, I would th like to turn this over to Mike now and to tell you a little bit about Lowry Digital uh, before we play the uh, video. Mike. Thank you, Dick. Um, what I'd like to start by saying is how honored those of us at Lowry Digital and our parent company, AdLabs Films, are to be involved with this historic project. Um, those of you who may have heard of Lowry Digital before would know us through our Hollywood film restoration work. We're probably the most prolific digital restoration house in the world, having restored everything from Casablanca and Singing in the Rain and The Robe, all the way up through the James Bond movies, Star Wars, uh, uh, the Indiana Jones trilogy. We've done, done over 400 classic feature films over the last 10 years. The obvious question is, what is it about this technology and what we do in Hollywood that applies to the Apollo program, and in particular, uh, the needs of the Apollo 11 archives? And I guess there are three things that I'd like to point out. The first is that it's not unusual at all for there to be missing elements in an archive uh, of original material. In the work we do on older films, the studios, the television broadcasters, the owners of the content routinely scour the earth to find the best surviving elements. And sometimes it's the original negative a film was shot with, sometimes it's a print that was distributed, sometimes it's some eclectic copy that someone has kept, and we are very often in the business of having to put together that patchwork, if you will, of material um, and make it uh, into a seamless finished piece of material. So. Um, the, the challenges, while they're significant here, are not foreign to us. The other interesting thing is that there's a bit of closure for us at Lowry Digital in that our founder, John Lowry, in the 1970s, he's, uh, he's been in the entertainment business for almost 50 years and he's a supreme technologist, and he invented a technology called video noise reduction in the 70s, which was actually applied on the Apollo 16 and 17 missions the live broadcasts from those missions was run through his electronic processing before broadcast around the world to give cleaner, um, better looking pictures. In the 90s, John recognized that that old technology that's based on trying to process live video as it streams by would be inadequate for the world we now live in, the world of DVDs and high definition television and digital theater, where we're looking at pictures that are much bigger and brighter and more detailed. And this idea of trying to improve pictures every 30th of a second as they stream by doesn't work. You, you can't make good trade-offs. So he's basically invented a whole new uh, technology where you put the quality of the image first. A motion sequence is an amazing treasure trove of information because every frame in that sequence has some information that it shares with others. And if you can determine what doesn't belong by analyzing those frames and extract the detail that does belong, you can make pictures sharper and more resolute, and you can also take the damage out of them. And that's exactly what we've been asked to do by NASA. 
We're going to run a very brief clip that just gives you a sense of our computer-based operation. It takes about 45 seconds, and then we'll close and look at some pictures. Um, we're located in Burbank, California, um, on a, a small side street near uh, many of the studios. We have a large team of digital artists who essentially intervene on pictures that the computers can't clean up all on their own. Um, we have folks who manage individual projects. This is Patrick Edquist, who is the project lead on the Apollo project, who essentially control the rendering of the work that we do. Um, editors who put together what you're going to see today, and a huge computer farm with about a petabyte of storage, that's a million gigabytes, to handle all of the frames of footage we have to process. And ultimately, in the end, we also screen them and review them in this uh, color screening room you've just seen. So where are we? It's 37 years after the invention of the very seminal technology, video noise reduction, that John Lowry pioneered on the Apollo 16 and 17 missions. 40 years from the Apollo project, and now we have the privilege of taking this new advanced technology that puts quality at a premium and tries to extract everything possible from motion sequences and bringing it back to NASA one more time. Um, as Dick said, and as we'll see shortly, just want to reemphasize, this is a multi-month project and you're getting a sneak peek at three weeks worth of work. So I hope what you'll find is there's great reason for encouragement about the quality of the elements NASA's found and what the technology can do with them. Thanks, Mike. And uh, again, I would say that I and the team and NASA is thrilled with the progress we've made. We are aiming for a September delivery of the final EVA um, restored video from the best available broadcast videos that we've been able to uh, obtain. Um, before we play the four scenes, and these were portions of the four scenes, uh, I want to tell you the first scene you'll see is Neil Armstrong coming down the steps and it will be clear to you that this is the worst video we had to work with. The most degraded, we had some con scan converter problems on the ground. Uh, the archival video you'll see is barely visible except for a foot and you can go ahead and roll that first clip and I'll explain what you're seeing. Uh, question and answer can go into detail. On the left is the available archival video now, uh, a dark image. On the right, you're now starting to see the full body of Neil Armstrong coming down the steps. It's lightened up. There's more detail. You see his helmet now. You see the reflection in his helmet. This is three weeks into the restoration. I, I think it's just amazing, um, not for myself, but for what Larry Digital is doing. This is restored. You now see his image clearly. He's jumping back up on the step. Um, okay, it will now okay. go to the next to that scene, step, which will be, uh, too far, but, which will uh, be the original scene. This is the archival, non-restored, and it'll wipe uh, over now, dissolve to this restored. You can now see the detail that is coming out. Uh, it's still dark, as we know. We have work to do but uh, we're starting to extract data. There's nothing being created. There's nothing being manufactured. We are restoring and extracting data that's in the video. Uh, that's what uh, Lowry does. Uh, the second tape will be Buzz Aldrin coming down the steps, and you can roll that. Again, the archival, you'll see noise streaking uh, on the left side. The detail's pretty good. Uh, on the right, you'll see it's clean. Uh, you'll actually, uh, when you see it, uh, in a different okay, viewpoint, you'll see that there's actually more detail and more uh, intricate lighting uh, or even lighting being produced. Uh, this is again uh, a portion of the restored video. Um, I keep wanting to say that this is a work in process so that nobody gets confused. September will be the final delivery. Uh, but the detail on the limb leg is uh, to me uh, ex just excellent and it's clean, very clean. But uh, you see the reflection in his helmet. That's the archival video that we had. Now we'll go to the restored video. There you go. Okay, now I think I'll do the same. The next thing uh, we'll see is what we labeled a plaque reading, and you can go ahead and roll that. This video now is showing the strut of the limb leg. The astronauts are reading a plaque signed by President Nixon. Uh, the archival, you can see again the graininess, the noise on the right. I think it's fairly evident uh, what we have is a cleaned up, uh, just 
to me amazing what we've done or what Lowry Digital's done in three weeks. This is a fully restore. You'll see the reflections of faces in that helmet, even. Um, I'm, I'm really excited on where we're headed with this. from the planet Earth, first step foot upon the moon, July 1969. This is the archival that has currently been viewed by most of the 600 million people that were around in that year. And again, unfortunately, we took a, a little darker scene to show you here, but you can see the detail and the uh, Christmas that is coming out after the restoration. The last scene is what we call a flag raising scene. This is where the American flag was raised. I think it fairly depicts, well, they ruled it. Um, if, on the left, as you see, I think it's a very good depiction of where we're headed. Uh, the noise, the lack of detail, and the upper part, bottom part of the lunar module. If you look on the right, you start seeing a lot of detail. It's clean. The surface of the moon is lit properly. This is the, from the sun. It was a camera and, and scan converter uh, issues on darkness. Uh, this is, there's your archival. This is what most of the world saw. Now, now we're looking at restored video and the detail on the lunar module and the astronauts and the overall picture clarity and cleanliness is, is coming along just terrific. Uh, these are the four scenes. They're just snippets from four scenes. The entire EVA is being restored and algorithms are being developed as we talk by Lowry Digital to further uh, bring out the detail uh, in, this, in this historic event. The goal of this team was, number one, to search for the slow scan, as you know. The goal of the team in doing that was to simply provide the best quality video of man's achievement in this historical event that could be given to the National Archives or anyone else in future generations. This is the only time it happened. I don't want to overplay it, but it, it certainly is historical to me. When I was a 28-year-old engineer, maybe I didn't understand that, but I certainly do now. And uh, this team was so dedicated. Uh, the Australians, uh, Mr. LaVar, uh, thousands of people around the world have contacted us trying to help us. Uh, so this is something that it's not just what we want. Uh, I think it's what most people in the world want, is the best possible uh, preservation of history and an achievement. And uh, I'll turn it back to Mark. All right, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. I have one thing to ask of you, which is to please come to the microphone, identify yourself, your affiliation, uh, and then ask your question. Seth Borenstein, the Associated Press. Uh, Two-part question, please. Um, First, for, um, I guess for Dick, in terms of, can you go into a little more detail in layman's terms on why the original, when we saw 40 years ago, was so degraded, I mean, so degraded, what were the if causes of the deg degradation besides sure. radiation? And second, are you concerned at all that going through a Hollywood um, digitizing firm is going to only encourage some of the, uh, for lack of a better word, um, science-oriented uh, people who are conspiracy theorists? Well, let me ask you the answer to your first question. Um, and I will answer your second question, too. But the first question is, um, what caused the degradation? Well, first of all, the, the format of the TV downlink was called slow scan. This is not broadcast. It's not the resolution of broadcast. However, the downlink video, if viewed directly on a slow scan device, was excellent. It was outstanding. And uh, Mr. LaVar uh, deserves a pat on the back for what they did. Um, Mr. LaVar blames me for the degradation, and I, I would take some of that blame. We built scan converters. Scan converters had to take the video and convert it to a broadcast standard. In 1969, okay, this is not the computer world. It's not the digital world. Uh, we had to take that video and display it on a special monitor. That monitor was viewed by an RCA camera. This is a converter, by the way, built by RCA Corporation in Camden. It was state of the art, and it viewed through a set of optics this slow scan picture. It then repeated it five more times so that instead of, for those technical people that understand, instead of 10 frames a second, it was now broadcast 60 frames. But you're now repeating things. You're repeating things that are now going to look like ghosting because you've got six of these repeat pictures before the next scene is seen. So someone floats by and it looks ghosty. The converter itself had a lot of setup, a lot of setup adjustments that had to be made depending on the conditions of the lighting on the moon, the setup, uh, what they call sync and setup and brightness and luminance. Uh, depending on, in those days, the operator we had. I won't, won't say we're flying by the seat of our pants, but 
Television on the moon was not something that was planned for 15 years. It was, I bought these converters six months before the, the mission started. Um, and, and they were excellent converters, but uh, there would be some degradation. Some of the degradation that you saw was not uh, necessary. It was uh, some operator error, some setup error. Um, so degradation would occur by conversion, but in order to get live TV from the moon, when everything was set perfect, it was certainly acceptable for a historic event, and that was our goal, and that's what we did. Uh, the second question is working with a company from Hollywood. I don't care where they're from. Um, this company is restoring historic video, and the historic video we're restoring for the future is the goal. And it mattered not to me where the company was from. Secondly, this particular company, uh, as opposed to anyone else I know in the world, has a history with NASA. And that history is a direct support of NASA video downlinks. Uh, there couldn't be a more perfect match for this to be done with. Mike, did, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I don't think so. I, 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 two things, I guess, just technically, although these guys know better than I. The original camera footage was 320 lines compared to the 525 lines we're used to in today's standard definition television and the 1080 lines of HD. So you're dealing with limited resolution and then being analog with all of the broadcast, both terrestrial and to, the, and to, uh, and to Earth, um, you had all kinds of analog introduction of timing errors and noise, et cetera, that were just typical of that time. Right, I, I would say, in all, in all candor, uh, if that slow scan was converted with no restoration or no conversion uh, uh, de degradation, you, you'd probably be 40 to 50% better than you ever saw right away. Uh, that's just a fact of life. That was the conversion process. So uh, the camera being low resolution didn't mean it wouldn't be super TV compared to what we were able to get through conversion. And I'm sorry, one more quickie, which is we, we're being very careful here in the work we do and in getting guidance from NASA on what to fix and what not. There are elements in the original photography, for example, the ghosting you see, which is, a, which is an artifact of the, of the analog tube camera and the upside down initial footage where we're not touching or making corrections that one normally would make. So right. we're being extremely right. conservative now, conspiracy theorists are going to believe what they're going to believe, and perhaps there's some, some value in the fact we're not a special effects house, we're a restoration house, but nevertheless, right. we're being extremely cautious. Let, let me add one quick comment to that, which uh, Mike triggered in the fellow from AP that asked that question. When you see the, uh, most of the EVA, you'll see uh, beside the astronauts what looks like a pole sticking in the ground. It looks like a flagpole. And if you watch them during the EVA, you'll see they some, some, somehow walk through it. Uh, that's not a pole. That's a reflection from the side of one of the lunar module legs, a reflection within the camera on the moon. We did not remove that intentionally. Um, we are not going to remove anything that came down as video, even if that wasn't supposed to be video. Uh, so when you see that pole, it's not a pole. It's a reflection. Go ahead. Maggie Fox with Reuters. I, I wasn't clear that bit about the 40,000 tapes that got pulled. Were they erased? Were they thrown away? Can you be... The, the tapes, uh, which were this size, they didn't have to all be exactly this. The uh, 40,000 boxes, it's really 200,000 of these. They were bought by truckload. This was not abnormal. I, I don't mean that someone in the middle of the night started pulling tapes out to, to get rid of them so that no one could see them. This was a normal process to stock tapes. You know, the uh, budget for NASA was not completely... Uh, produced just to buy tapes, so uh, these are expensive. Um, these tapes, 40,000 uh, boxes, and then followed later years by 30,000, because I can't tell you which years the Apollo 11 tapes were in there, probably the 70 to 74, uh, contained five tapes each or 200,000. They were, what they do, they recertify them. They take a look at them, they degauss them. They then put information on there and see if that is holding and is giving them the correct error rate that is acceptable in the network. If it is, it's recertified, sent out, and it's used as if it's new. You're saying degaussed. They it were means de erased. De you erased, erased and recertified for use in the network with nothing on it. And can I just ask, why couldn't you just use the original set that you used to? Say again? Why couldn't you just use the original um, set that you used to fake this landing in the first place? You use the original set for, I didn't I'm, get the I'm question. trying to make a joke, but it's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Keith Cowling, NASAWatch.com. Two-part question. Um, you were there, 
at the time this happened, and I've talked to some TV people who were in professional TV at the time, and they're a little startled that you did not have a second set, set of tapes uh, or recordings made at the time. You yourself have said many times it's a once in a, a lifetime thing. And it, yes. And second part is, um, uh, uh, how to put this gently, um, uh, these were the floppy disks of the day, were they not? They were what? The flop, these were the equivalent of the floppy disks of the day. They were treated as such. When you were done using them, you just erased them and used them again. You mean the tapes? Yeah, I mean, back no. then. No. Okay, well then here's the other. Uh, well, let, I, me answer, let me answer what I think well, you're asking. Well, here's, here's the other question then. Why is it, and I have some personal experience having gone through another data set, the Lunar Orbiter tapes, why somebody at the time didn't say for these 45 tapes, ooh, these are special. This is Apollo 11. Why right. they didn't put a gold right. star on it? Right, right. Well, I think you asked three or four questions, Keith, but I'll, I'll try it. Three. Three, okay. Second set of tapes, there were a second set of tapes. Every site had a second set of tapes. Those tapes were not required to be shipped to Goddard. They were required that once the data was shipped to Goddard, received, and the data live was received, those tapes were reused on site. That was standard procedure. Those are called backup tapes to the tapes. And the tapes in this case were back up for TV. That may get a little confusing to everybody, but we always recorded more than one set. But no, we didn't reserve more than one set or preserve it. Once we had the data and the program said we're happy, we kept the primary set for the National Record Center. The second thing is, are they set, are they considered a sloppy disk? I'm not sure I quite understand that. We didn't use them and throw them away. We stored them for two to three years and then evaluated them year to year as to whether they would stay there, be extended, be reused or not. They were not automatically withdrawn for recertification. They were evaluated and the program had to sign off that they no longer needed any of the data on there. Your question's a good one, and I'm an engineer, I'm not a historian. The question is, why didn't someone just look at those 45 tapes and say there's something special? Boy, do we wish they'd done that. Um, I think the answer is, and I'm giving my opinion, okay, uh, this is the only time in the Apollo program we ever recorded television on a telemetry tape. 14 track tape, one track TV. Every other mission was a television tape. It'd be hard not to see that it was a tape for television. This was one track on 14 uh, tracks of, of these tapes. Foresight, or hindsight would say, oh, yeah, of course, we should have. We should have had a historian that was running around saying, I don't care if you can ever use them, I want to keep them. Uh, I'm an engineer. My job was to process TV, to get it to Houston, get it live to the world. Where the tapes went, I didn't even know at that time. That was my, my job. I knew who handled tapes, but I didn't know their the details of their job until I started searching back to, to what happened. But uh, Keith, I could only tell you that, that uh, that's what we all in the, in the team had wished, that somebody had said those tapes have got to be set aside uh, as special. But they were, I think, in my opinion, they were treated as telemetry tapes. And when the program, again, knowing that the, the goal was live TV, and these were recorded for backup if there was a failure. No one was looking historically at anything at that point. It was the success of the mission. If there's a problem, we'll play them back. At this point, when they came into Goddard, I'm afraid everybody treated this no different than voice or biomedical data. Okay, simple follow-up question. You're working on a formal report. When will that be released to the public? Uh, we hope very shortly, days. Days, okay, yeah. thank you. Hi, uh, Daniel Nassau with The Guardian uh, newspaper. Um, I just want to clarify what is being shown for the first time today. Is it the, the, the high quality, or is there stuff that we're looking at, images that have not been seen in no. 35 or 40 years? Good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, what's being shown today are images that have been seen many, many times. What you're seeing is a partial re restoration of those images which is approaching, Larry Ditch is approaching to a September delivery of the final. You're seeing the improved quality of the restoration of the best available broadcast tapes that we've been able to come up with. And Lowry Digital is restoring those. And what I'm saying to you is that we're doing a preliminary release, not to be confused with September coming up, so that during the 40th anniversary, we can all see that we, we know we had bad news. We don't have the slow scan. But we have some good news, and the good news is we're going to have a significantly better history record of, of this achievement. And uh, follow up, if I may, what went on, what replaced this stuff on the original telemetry tapes? I mean, what it, replaced this? More telemetry data. A any guess as to what that could be? Like voice, biomedical, health and welfare of the spacecraft, tracking data. 
we had 14 tracks, and, and you're happy to look at the uh, labels, but so, lots of data went on those. But, but the data that went on there normally is, is, is uh, you know, a, a very small uh, uh, digital, uh, not digital, but analog signal. Uh, TV, even though it was only 500 kilohertz, one-eighth of a broadcast signal, that took these things to run the fastest speed possible. The only recorder we had that could even capture it. Uh, so that was very unusual, and it was on one of these tracks, and that's what happened. So data from a later mission? What? W went it, on, replaced the Apollo 11 uh, information on the telemetry tapes. Yeah, and, and one of the later missions, when these tapes were stored, well, this would be at least three to four years later that these tapes would have come out of the National Records Center and back into the system. So it could be anywhere from the end of Apollo to Skylab to Apollo Soyuz mission. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com and Space.com. A couple of questions. First, has um, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, and for that matter, Mike Collins, had a chance to see the rest restoration? What's been their reaction? Say again, I, I'm sorry. Has Buzz Neil, and Neil been able to see the rea um, restored footage so far, think, what has been no, their reaction? Uh, they have not seen this yet. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the contract that you entered with Lowry started uh, for the Apollo 11 footage. Are you working on, on plan or planning to work on other missions if there's a value to working on other missions TV? Well, I'm an, <clears throat> an old engineer at NASA and would love to work on anything Apollo, but uh, that would be NASA headquarters telling me whether they want to fund it. Um, I think where, where we're at, in my opinion, and Mark's better to speak to it, is we're going to finish this job, and we're, we're going to finish this and see what we can do, and then discuss whether there's anything else that, that would be addressed. But that is kind of out of my ball, ball, ballpark. And lastly, since you said that you pulled the best of the broadcast tapes for this project, they're now as close as we come to originals. Uh, where are they going to be kept so that they, they don't get lost in the they're future? Going to be kept, they're going to be kept at NASA. Um, what we did was we, of course, transferred them to high-rate digital data, but the original tapes, uh, CBS still has theirs. NARA still has their original return to them. Okay, uh, the videotape from Sydney we have, but uh, these are returned after digitization into the archives of CBS. And when I say best, it doesn't mean they're the best because we saw every tape in the world. We mean they're the best that we found available and that they were at a level that we could work with with Lowry Digital. We have many, many tapes that you can see broadcast. Everyone saw broadcast. These are not at your home off the air. These are recorded at locations that made them better and cleaner and easier to work with. Okay. Thanks. Now, I, I will say one thing that I think is important and maybe gives a ray of hope to everybody. Uh, and I'd like to address this briefly uh, so you, you'll know and it won't come up later. Uh, during our search, um, our friends in Australia um, saw some photographs at Parks Australia of a recorder of the type that I used uh, to record converted video. Uh, but we didn't have converted video at Parks, so we started talking amongst ourselves about why are these recorders there. Uh, we saw a picture of a man, we, w uh, an engineer with these recorders. Um, we pursued who that was and why he would be there because I knew nothing about it and I was in charge of handling TV. We were able to track down that he was from Applied Physics Lab in Skaggsville, Maryland. Uh, Stan and I, in our search in the National Records Center, came across not only tapes, we searched for tapes everywhere, and not just by numbers of shipments into there. We walked with escorts through the bowels. They let us do things they normally don't do, and went through everywhere there could be any tape anywhere near this size. We also went to records. I came across a box of records that I wanted to look at that were in the era of, of the Apollo 11 and had to do with Australia. Long story short, those records revealed teletypes that said, we are proceeding well on the modification of these VR662 inch machines in parks to record the slow scan. Eureka, Eureka, we have another source of slow scan for most of this mission that was recorded in Parks Australia. This has not been revealed before, and I'm revealing it now. And the reason I'm doing it is those tapes, we tracked down the individual that made that. This was an experimental program between NASA Goddard and APL. I'm assuming I wasn't told because I was busy running all over the world. Uh, my supervisor, who's retired, it was news to him. But 
but that's not important. What was important is somebody actually modified a two-inch machine at one location called Parks Australia to record these just to see if they could do it. Those tapes from the records were brought back and deposited Goddard. But the interview with the gentleman who did it said, well, I don't know if they were shipped back or I brought them back, but I can tell you this. I played them at APL and I showed my management these tapes and they were slow scan and it worked very well. Now, we weren't grading how well. If it's slow scan, it's slow scan. Those tapes we conducted a special search for. We've checked the records. APL did everything they could to help us look through their archives, uh, their ex-employees. We've talked to retirees. We've visited homes. Those tapes could have come back to Goddard. We've looked for any record to show where they went. These two tapes, consisting of an hour each, approximately, are miss missing. Uh, we are still open to finding those two-inch tapes because they are slow scan. Um, that is something that was came out of the woodwork and, and is something that we were shocked about, but we don't know where they are. We don't know if everything came back to Goddard or not. There seems to be no paper trail. And one of the reasons for that is Parks was not a tracking site. Parks was not a NASA tra tracking site. Parks was a borrowed facility, and what we did there was not under the normal procedures, rules, and operations that we had for tapes like this. It had to be brought back, had to go into the WNRC. These tapes had n no requirement to come back to Goddard and go to the WNR, to the National Records Center, and I'm sure they, they didn't because we searched all tapes, but they didn't. They're not in the system. Television was an add-on experimental program at Parks, was not even officially there, uh, it, it documented. This was a last minute thing. So we know there's two tapes and we're certainly open to leads to finding those, whether they uh, be at Goddard or anywhere else. We do have a hard close off at 11, or at noon, excuse me. So I'm going to let one more question and then I have one thing I, I need to do before we close out uh, today. So go ahead, sir. Uh, Mike Lucibella, Inside Science News. Uh, I was just wondering, is there any policy in place at NASA to prevent something like this from happening again? Uh, I think NASA's policy generally is to review all program data when the program comes to an end. I certainly uh, don't speak for NASA. I, I don't get involved in the policy, to be honest with you. I think that would be better asked to uh, management of NASA. I, I certainly think we'll, if not, we certainly need to be reviewing all possible historical data that might be coming to an end in a program. There was a, a question. How much will this cost? I'm sorry. Uh, Dick, go ahead and ask your question. It's a, it's a brief one. How much, will, how much will this program cost? Which program? The, to, to digitize it and to... Oh, to oh the restoration? Uh, it's approximately $230,000 total uh, to be completed in September. Does that, does that include the cost of looking for the, for the tapes? The, the looking for the tapes, uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, there's thousands of hours that are volunteer. This man has paid nothing, which is the way I like it. Um, I have two people in Australia, they're paid nothing. Uh, Mr. Wood in the Mojave, uh, from Goldstone, they've all signed no payment agreements with NASA. I'm the only one that's paid, and I didn't have that many hours because I'm working shuttle. Okay, um, Dick, we're going to let Stan read a very special piece of paper that, uh, that he received this morning. So go ahead, Stan. Yeah. Uh, I have something that I want to share with you. Um, we have a, a gentleman we had mentioned earlier named Colin McKellar, who is part of our search team, and he's in Sydney, Australia. And he's a historian. Besides working with us, he is a historian on Apollo. And he has been, over time, in communication with Neil Armstrong, and they have communicated quite frequently. Now, they're having a big celebration down in Australia for the 40th, and he asked Neil uh, if he could write something for them that he could read at this 40th anniversary bash. And he sent me the letter that Neil wrote. It was not a small letter, it was quite long. And in it was a paragraph that he pointed my attention to. It's the only time I ever heard a Neil comment uh, on the camera as he was on, and he, he's commenting on the camera about when he was on the moon and what he thought at the time. So it's a rather uh, interesting document because 
he sort of sums up what most of us felt. So I'd like to read this little excerpt for you. And uh, it goes like this. I remember all the pre-flight testing we were doing on that little black and white image TV camera. In all that testing, I never saw a picture successfully transmitted, but the chaps assured us that it would and in, and in fact work, and it did. And I was probably the most surprised person in the human race when Mission Control announced they were getting a picture. So I was never concerned that the picture quality was less than optimum. I was just amazed that there was any picture at all. And I, and I like to tell you that going back in time, uh, this was never a sure thing. Uh, the, 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 the links of trans, from the transmission uh, from the moon to uh, the tracking sites, uh, the converter, the, the huge tracking uh, transmission that went to uh, 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 Houston, uh, all of these, any one of these could have caused, if there was any burp at all, we could have had a failure and no, no image. So his comment at the time that, that it, it isn't quality, it was less than our, our general feeling was when we saw the, the image on, that was very degraded, but what we felt at the time, we got a picture, and it was, uh, to us, it was the most unbelievable miracle that anyone could have, that here we had the, the image and the, and the world saw it. So I, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting little statement by, by Neil. Let me just close by uh, a couple of thank yous. First of all, to thank the National Electronic Museum in Lithicum for uh, bringing this uh, uh, camera for us to see today. And also, of course, a very special thanks to our host today, the museum. We very much appreciate that they uh, allowed us to come here today and show you these, uh, these images. So thank you all for coming. I'm sure these gentlemen will be around if you'd like to speak with them afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>